Poštovani gledalci, ukupna situacija sa ratom u Ukrajini je vrlo važna, međutim još je važnije ono što se dešava na drugoj strani granice u Rusiji, a pogotovo kada je u pitanju ruski predsjednik Vladimir Putin, jedan od onih koji ga poznaju je i Vladimir Milov koji je nekada bio zamjenik ministra ekonomije u Rusiji, a onda se priključi onima koji pripadaju danas opoziciji. U nastavku razgovaramo s gospodinom Milovom o svemu što se dešava. Vladimir Milov, welcome to program N1. Thanks for having me. Pleasure being here. I said in my opening that you were former economy uh, deputy economy minister in, in, in Russia. So you know Vladimir Putin and you know the regime in Moscow, but also you know the opposition side of what's going on. So looking at this um, 40 plus days of a war in Ukraine, would you say as uh, Mikhail Hodorkovsky says that the Vladimir Putin is crazy because nothing goes as he has planned to happen in Ukraine with this war. Well, yes, uh, most definitely. I think your viewers should understand that uh, this uh, imperialist fever has been gradually developing over the past uh, 20 years. Initially, when Putin came to power, he was speaking like in a totally different language. You can watch uh, his speech and press conference in May 2002, 20 years ago, at the Rome summit with NATO, where Russia and NATO signed uh, the, the famous Rome Declaration, now essentially extinct. Uh, they were, there were a lot of hugs and kisses and speaking about how important NATO is for global security. But uh, I think over years, uh, Putin developed uh, a significant hatred and fear of the Western democracies as an existential threat. Uh, he's very much afraid that his dictatorship's days are numbered and, uh, and he fears that liberal democracy is his enemy. But right now, I think the key existential threat to him is Ukraine, because that's a very similar nation uh, which have been essentially able to shrug off any attempts to establish a uh, Russia-type uh, dictatorship. And it uh, completely uh, turned up against uh, Putin's attempts to include Ukraine in his uh, exclusive zone of dominance and influence. This is why, to make the long story short, this is why finally he decided to attack Ukraine and conquer it militarily. He's failing. Yes, he's desperate. He, he counted on a blitzkrieg, on a very fast capture of Kyiv and major cities. I think he's bitterly wounded now, which is why we probably should, unfortunately, expect uh, more madness and more atrocities from him. Um, in line of that, do you expect that he might try to go and attack or destabilize countries, for example, as uh, Finland or Sweden, or even to try to destabilize the region of the Western Balkans, where we know that he has some of politicians who are well, very well in his uh, way of uh, thinking and dealing, and he has influence over them. Well, uh, we're not there yet. Uh, I think uh, a lot really is decided on the battlefields of Ukraine right now. And it's important to understand that a Russian army had suffered an immense damage uh, in the course of the past uh, six weeks. Uh, if just uh, we uh, will see more uh, offensives in eastern Ukraine, in Donbass, with Putin trying to regain momentum and so on, there will be more losses, which means that the Russian military will not be in a position to attack anyone sometime soon uh, after uh, this kind of uh, failures and uh, this kind of military defeats. However, there is always a risk uh, because uh, in the past few weeks, we clearly saw that there are no limits uh, for Putin's desire to expand his influence. He can, he can go for anything, use any tools, and of course, uh, covert influence in uh, politics and business in the societies of European countries. From uh, Scandinavia to West Balkans, again, he's been doing that all along. Uh, we see clearly many agents of his influence, and he will not stop. He's, got, he's still got a lot of money. His network of malign influence is extremely wide, and uh, while he's in power, he's really dangerous in that regard. He can be a very destabilizing actor. Now, we know that the um, US and European Union has um, imposed the sanctions on him and uh, people around him and uh, oligarchs 
even um, on his uh, daughters. But what is more damaging to him, those kinds of sanctions, or for example, if Europe stops using um, gas and oil coming from um, Russia, we know that the Jose Borrell has said that the European Union over the last 40 days paid about 35 uh, billion euros to Russia for their gas. Uh, currently imposed sanctions are very significant. They are extremely severe. So they alone, everything that has been imposed so far, already has a potential to significantly cut off Russia from global economy, financial markets, technologies, logistics. This alone has a potential of bringing down Putin's regime uh, further down the road. However, yes, uh, he's temporarily buying time because he still receives a lot of cash from Europe uh, in return for uh, energy supplies. That is a factor that continues uh, to allow him to operate, uh, to finance his army, to sustain the economy, and that is important. I think more and more people in Europe are realizing that energy embargo is a logical next step in uh, preventing Putin from continuing his aggressive policies. In, in line of this, do you as expect that the oligarchs, if pressured too much by the West, could start going against him and trying to pot topple him in one point, or we will see that the military in one point will try to topple him down and his regime? No, I think there is zero possibility for that, and we should not have a rosy hopes about it, because... Uh, Putin had been deliberately building a system during his 20 plus years in power with a lot of checks and a lot of barriers for uh, potential, you know, people who will try to instigate a coup d'etat. Like just for once, you mentioned military, but there are many different military and security agencies in Russia. Coordination between them is very poor. Many of them are specifically built uh, to defend Putin like his uh, 50,000 uh, personnel presidential guard, which also controls all the special communications so you can't cut him off. It's not like the Soviet times. So that's, I think that's extremely dangerous. Moreover, I know a lot of people who still work in the government and they tell me that they are very afraid even to discuss uh, such a possibility because they, they believe that they are wiretapped all the time and this can be recorded and reported. It's just another barrier. So I think uh, if, if we're talking about ways to stop all this madness, it should be all of the above. We should double down on sanctions. We should work with public opinion in Russia and uh, change it uh, against uh, support of uh, Putin's regime and Putin's war. We should also support Ukraine militarily, support Ukrainian resistance. So I think I don't think there's a magic silver bullet which can prevent him from going further. I think we should double down on efforts on all fronts against Putin. This is an all-out war to defend the global democratic order, freedom, democracy, to which Ukraine is simply a front. I know that you worked with um, Alexei Navalny, and we know that he is in jail at the moment. But there is a lot of talk about Navalny list of oligarchs and people around Putin, uh, which should be used to go after them. So is that the way how we should um, go and work to uh, basically support the position at the moment, to support independent media, and then to uh, work with those who are still willing to work against Putin to topple him down? Yes, uh, it's important that democratic forces in Russia are supported because I think that's the only hope. Uh, if there will be no regime change in Russia, Putin or his aggressive imperialist successors will be coming back around time and again. After some retreat, regrouping, resupplying, uh, they will be coming back around to, to haunt everybody else, all of their neighbors, all the European nations to spread their malign influence. So. The only way forward uh, is to really shift Russia towards uh, a normal, democratic, peaceful coexistence with the rest of the world, with the rest of Europe, which is why support for democratic forces is important. And uh, I think I agree with President Biden in this regard. As long as Putin remains in power, there can be no peace, no normality, no stabilization uh, in the European space. Now, can you pull back a curtain and tell us 
what is life today in Russia under his um, leadership and under his control? Because I know my colleagues from Rain TV have left the country. Echo Moscow is um, closed, and also they are trying ways to um, broadcast from the outside. We also know that many other um, associates of Alexei Navalny have left the uh, country. You yourself, you're outside of um, Russia. So uh, what is the life inside the country at the moment? It is basically a life of terror that people in the free world basically cannot even imagine. Uh, you're right, I was forced to flee. I would have been jailed by now. I spent some time in jail myself as well. But uh, it's just, I mean, it's just beyond uh, the uh, political activists. Uh, what we saw in the past few months is like police uh, knocking on doors of tens of thousands of people who have been uh, uh, included in some database of unreliable citizens because they reposted some opposition articles or videos or they put a like on Instagram to Navalny's post. Many of people are being fired from their jobs. There is a very active persecution of those who criticize the war in Ukraine right now. Uh, uh, Russia had adopted a specific legislation for, as they call it, spreading fake news about uh, Russian military operations that envisages up to 15 years in prison for criticizing Putin's war. And many people are already being persecuted, specifically and charged with spreading the truth about the war. So that's an atmosphere of total terror. And uh, still, despite that, tens of thousands of Russians have been coming out protesting on the streets against the war, which are really brave and courageous people that give us hope for the better future of the country. Now, let me ask you also this. Um, we know what language is coming, propaganda language, which is coming from um, Moscow through the media, which are under control of uh, president. We also know what kind of political rhetoric is coming from, example, from Ambassador Nebenzia at the United uh, Nations. But how dangerous is that um, rhetoric can be not only for Russia, but also for the regions like the Western Balkans, because we still have here presence of uh, Sputnik and um, RT, especially in Serbia. I think it is important to take note of this rhetoric, because in the, in the recent few weeks, uh, Russian authorities have been actually showing their real natural face, who they really are. They sort of dropped this idea that we were simply threatened by enlargement of NATO, and they really are admitting that um, what they're doing is the, you know, the advance of uh, conquest uh, and uh, the desire to, to crush the independence of neighboring countries, uh, uh, to uh, enlarge the Russian empire by extreme brutality and extreme means with a total disregard of uh, human life, uh, of the aspirations and will of the free peoples of the countries that surround Russia. I think they, they are becoming more real in this rhetoric. I think we should look into that. And uh, yeah, many people are terrified, but I think we also need to be uh, somewhat calm and cold blooded about this, really realizing who we're dealing with. Uh, these are, I mean, they're calling Ukrainian government Nazis, but uh, if you really listen to the rhetoric of Russian officials, this is really something resemblant of 1930s, 1940s uh, in Europe and of Nazi rhetoric. So I think we should really realize what a, what a difficult enemy we're dealing with. And yes, they also uh, consider West Balkans, I'd say, as the next potential goal. They do have major influence there in Serbia, in Montenegro. Unfortunately, in Bosnia as well, you remember when the leader of Republika Serbska, Dodik, went uh, to Putin to meet him in early December. He came back and uh, made a lot of destabilizing statements, clearly, you know, bringing the approval of his Moscow boss uh, for what he is doing. So I think it, it, we should be fully aware of this network of malign influence. Sorry, sorry and... to interrupt you, but when you mentioned Mr. Dodik, he just wrote a letter to Vladimir Putin and um, Sergei Lavrov to inform them about the um, situation with the Altea mission, the European and NATO mission here in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also about potential vote of Bosnia at the United Nations um, General Assembly. Uh, do you think that that will encourage Putin and Lavrov to uh, try to re-influence 
um, here in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also in the region? Well, I think they will simply continue to be using a Republika Serbska as a destabilizing factor because they really understand uh, that they can really not do much about the position of uh, the population and political forces of uh, the uh, Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. They can only influence the Serbian community. So they, so they cannot overwhelm it. So this is why they're going to be using as as a destabilizing factor pretty much like everywhere else, like in Montenegro, for example, with Serbia, obviously, but uh, other West Balkan nations as well. So I think uh, clearly the, uh, beyond Ukraine, their eyes are also focused on uh, Western Balkans. And I mean, uh, there, is, uh, there is nothing that they would spare in terms of uh, uh, continuing the destabilizing activity. They still have a lot of resources to continue that. And they're really very desperate after their recent defeats in Ukraine, after being badly wounded by Western sanctions. So they might retaliate. Uh, they are very revengeful at the moment. And Western Balkans might be a target. Um, and my last question uh, to you is, you know him personally, I mean Vladimir Putin. Um, how damaging or um, inflicting for him is that the comedian from Kyiv, Volodymyr Zelensky, is winning against him, um, KGB agent, student of um, history, and someone who sees himself as a big world leader, the one of the big ones on the world stage. That's damaging, but this is just one of the damaging factors because uh, uh, he and his uh, entourage of uh, very imperialistic, chauvinistic, uh, closest aides, they really do not believe that Ukraine is a real nation, uh, so, which is why it's very painful for them not only to see uh, such a, you know, such a drastic alternative that Zelensky is, because he's a lively person, he addresses uh, Russians in Russian language, actually speaking the truth and speaking without written script, right? Uh, and, uh, but, but generally, I think more offensive uh, for them is that their concept of Ukraine as just a minor dialect of Russia, you know, not being a real nation is collapsing by the minute. I think this is all extremely damaging to their imperialist concept, but they're not, Putin is not defeated yet, which, which means that we need to double down uh, the efforts of the free world to make that happen. Vladimir Milov, thank you so very much for your time and looking forward, I'm pretty sure that we will have another chance to speak again soon. Thank you so much. Pleasure talking to you.